Greetings. Uh, so this, besides being possibly the worst green screen effect video that you've ever seen, is a video to support the uh, Electronic Projects Lab class, the intro one that's analog. It's not supposed to replace the class, but it's intended as a reference. So if you missed a lecture uh, or a presentation, or if you just want to see something a second time to review it, uh, then that's what this is for. This particular video is on introductory concepts. So uh, let's start with the basics about what exactly electricity is. Uh, electricity is the movement of electrical charge through a circuit. And as we'll see, there are actually two different kinds of electrical charge, but usually what we're talking about is moving electrons. I'll do a little demo here showing electricity at work by hooking up a circuit. Humans have known about electrical charge for millennia. Uh, the Greek word for the material amber is electron, and that's the word that electricity is derived from. Apparently women in ancient Greece uh, noticed that when rubbing amber against their silk uh, clothing, it caused it to accumulate a charge, which they used to shock small frogs as entertainment at parties. Uh, I heard about this at a lecture at MIT. I'm not sure exactly what literature records the Greek women shocking frogs. Um, but uh, also my sister, when we were little, as a prank, she would uh, come up behind me and rub her feet on the carpet and then uh, shock my earlobe uh, and then you know giggle when that happened. That's the same thing. Or you might have rubbed a balloon on your hair and then stuck it to the wall like it was held there by a magnet. Uh, but there's no magnets involved. It's electrical charge. And as we'll see later, electricity and magnetism are mysteriously bound together as a force. So generating charge, electrical charge in this way, is uh, using something called the triboelectric effect. And there's videos on the website that give more information about the triboelectric effect. Uh, the phenomenon of accumulated electrical charge, what we call static electricity, uh, fascinated people for centuries, and uh, people experimented with it trying to do useful things, using it to pick up small things like when uh, styrofoam sticks to your fingers or shocking a doorknob is not really very useful. But if there was some way that it could be stored, this electricity, and uh, we could control it and uh, control its movement uh, into a continuous flow, the thinking was maybe it could do useful work in the same way that uh, the force of a flowing, uh, flowing water in a stream had been made to um, move milling stones uh, or other kinds of uh, useful projects. So tremendous advance in, in this uh, direction was made in experiments that happened in the uh, 18th and early 19th centuries. In the early 1700s, a French chemist named Dufay gave names to the two kinds of electrical charge, resinous electricity and vitreous electricity. He thought of it as a fluid because if you rubbed on something that had a charge, you could get some on you, sort of like something getting wet, and that after a while it would sort of evaporate that charge. And he noticed that there were two kinds because the like charges, the ones that were the same kind, repelled each other, and the different kinds, the two different charges, uh, were attracted to each other. Uh, I have a little video demo here I can show you. First, the professor is rubbing a glass rod with silk, which causes it to be positively charged. The balloon, because it's metallic, is a conductor, and electrons can move in it, and they coat the surface with a tiny layer that's negative and attracts it to the positively charged glass rod. But as he proceeds to sort of continue rubbing a positive charge on the balloon, he gradually imparts a positive charge along that surface, so it causes the balloon to become positive as well. And once this happens, when he brings the glass rod close to the balloon, they repel because they're both positive. Next, he rubs a rod made out of rubber with fur, uh, which makes the rubber rod negatively charged, and the balloon that's now positive is attracted to the negative rod. In the Dutch city of Leiden, it was discovered that a very large electrical charge could be stored in an insulated container that uh, came to be called a Leyden jar. The Leyden jar stored a charge that could be discharged all at once, similar to the behavior of a modern-day capacitor.
Then in 1800, Alessandro Volta, after whom the Volt is named, discovered that you could generate electricity chemically and using that process invented the battery. The battery allowed people to store a charge and release it gradually in a controlled way through an electrical circuit for the first time. So this progress of getting a storing charge was making progress and Benjamin Franklin sold his press and invested in experimentations with electricity in the mid-1700s. He ex suggested an experiment. It's thought that he actually did carry this out. The experiment was that you could fly a kite in a thunderstorm with a metal key attached and the moist kite string would conduct electricity that would go down and could be attached to a laden jar and that electricity could then be stored there, uh, a massive amount of, electri of electrical charge from lightning. There were popular stories that he flew a kite and it was struck by lightning, but if he'd actually been hit by lightning in that way, it probably would have killed him. So that, we're pretty sure, did not happen. But there is ambient electrical charge in a thunderstorm from the clouds that would indeed have been conducted through a wet string attached to a laden jar that would have been able to, to store an electrical charge. Franklin made several significant contributions. Uh, one, that he posited that the lightning in the sky was indeed the same electricity that was used to shock frogs with amber. He also correctly put forward that, unlike Dufay's concept that there were two different kinds of electricity, um, he put forward the idea that there was one kind of electricity that resulted in two kinds of electrical charge. One that was a positive charge, which uh, was caused by an abundance of electricity, and another one that was a negative that was the result of a deficit or a smaller amount. So he, Benjamin Franklin is where we get this concept of a plus and minus, or a positive and a negative pole in an electrical circuit. His idea that the part that has an abundance, that's the flowing part, that's the source, that's the plus, it turns out that that thing that there's a lot of, there's an abundance of, are electrons. And when subatomic particles were uh, understood and discovered, uh, it came to be that the electron was a negatively charged particle. Actually, what's in fact going on at a subatomic level is that a thing called electron flow, which is that electrons are actually flowing out of a negatively charged hole uh, or terminal into the positive one. But it doesn't matter. Even though he got that wrong, uh, he had a 50-50 chance of getting it right, the positive and negative, and he got it wrong. Um, to this day, we still, uh, in our circuits that we design and that we build and that we uh, study, uh, they all use this thing called conventional current, which assumes that electrons are flowing from the positive pole of a battery or from an electrical circuit going to the negative. Just when we build our circuits and things, we'll just always assume that our source of current is from the positive going to the negative. So after that little bit of history, uh, let's define some terms. The invention of the battery by Alessandro Volta that I mentioned earlier uh, gave us a component a device that could store a charge and it has two poles, a plus and a minus, and if I connect a conductor from the plus through some kind of a load, something that's going to be using up electrical energy on its way to ground, then I've completed an electrical circuit. And by the way, anything that's using up electrical energy is what we call a load in a circuit. And if you ha cook up the positive pole to the negative without any kind of a load, then you've created something that's called a short circuit, which you should never do because the current draws as fast as it can through the circuit, which generates heat and can set things on fire, including with small batteries. The kind of electricity I'm using when I make that kind of a circuit is called DC or direct current. Uh, the other kind that comes out of the, a wall socket is called AC, which stands for alternating current. And the thing that's alternating in that current is which is plus and which is minus. And 60 times a second, it flips back and forth, and uh, we'll talk more about AC later. Earlier, when I referred to my sister as a prank coming up behind me and rubbing her feet on the carpet and shocking my ear, um, guess how many volts of electricity that, that were given to me in that shock when she shocked my ear? You might think a tiny amount, like, like uh, one volt or part of a volt. Uh, actually, it was closer to like 10,000 volts that my sister was shocking my ear with. That sounds really scary, um, but it didn't really hurt me any more than the static cling when you're taking a sweater out of a dryer uh, really hurts you. We need to understand what a volt is. We define electricity as an a electrical charge moving through a circuit. When it's moving, the amount, the volume of electrons moving 
is referred to as current. That's the name of the term for what that is. And it's measured in units called amperes or amps. So that's one property of electricity is, is current, which is the flow. But there's another one that's a little more mysterious, which is how highly motivated those electrons are to move, like what the force is behind it. That force is referred to as an electromotive force, and it's measured in units called volts. So volts are a unit of measure of electromotive potential. So uh, we saw the demo of the uh, mylar balloon with the rubber baton, and we saw that uh, it would be repelled or um, attracted. That force of attraction, like how strongly is it attracted, um, is a field effect uh, like gravity or like magnetism, uh, only in this case it has to do with the, the, the uh, field effect that is m causing the motivation of the electrons to move. And I think it's kind of a, a bit of a mysterious force because with electrons, they're a subatomic particle and subject to the rules of quantum physics, which are kind of mysterious to someone like me. Rules governing the behavior of subatomic particles like electrons are very hard to wrap our heads around because they don't uh, behave in the same way as objects uh, like a salt shaker on a table. Uh, we sometimes use metaphors to try and understand them. Uh, they're not exactly accurate because you need to use equations in physics to really be a scientist about that stuff, but um, to help us uh, lay persons understand behavior of electricity, people very often use uh, what's called the water metaphor. So in the water metaphor, we have a flow that we could say is similar like electricity flowing. In the water metaphor, the water pressure uh, or electromotive potential measured in volts, it would be the water pressure. That would be the size of the tank if we have a tank on a roof that's flowing, has water flowing from it out of a spigot. Uh, the size of the hose, whether it is like an IV drip that has like a little tiny bit of uh, flowing fluid or a fire hose, that flow is metaphorically current, measured in amperes. And then if we want to restrict the flow, we want to control it, uh, we can impede uh, how fast the electrons are traveling, or let's say the diameter of the hose by pinching it. And that impeding of the flow creates an electrical property called impedance or resistance, and it's measured in units called ohms. One way to understand uh, electrical potential is to think about uh, potential energy that's uh, physical force. In that case, the uh, potential difference could be controlled by let's say having circular objects on a table and you tilt it at an angle and the steeper the angle the more motivated they are to move and at a more gentle angle they would move more slowly so that changing of the angle changes the potential energy um, of how fast objects are going to be moving so in this case we're using gravity I have another example here where I'm using the hypothetical U-tube, like a sink, and I have a disequilibrium that I've created. But they would try to seek equilibrium because of, of gravity. So we can have a kinesthetic appreciation of the, the motivation of the force that's being applied there. And the same is happening in an electrical circuit where the uh, place where there is a greater concentration of electrons has a motivation to move to a place of the least concentration of electrons, which we call the negative pole or sometimes ground. How highly motivated it is, how, the greater the electrical potential between those two places, the potential difference, that determines this property called volts. A combination of voltage and current together um, is what gives us another uh, technical unit in electricity that's called power that's measured in watts. It's just the simple math, volts times amps equals watts, which is uh, a unit of measure of power. And so if you have a 100 watt light bulb, that's telling you how much power is necessary to power that light bulb. Uh, the number of volts that's used in an electrical outlet in a home unit is 110 volts typically. And the number of amperes is around 10 to 20 amps. I think in homes it's more like 15 amp circuits. And if you exceed that, the electrical energy being drawn through the circuit causes heat. It's that the flow of the electrons is so intense that it makes things heat up and that will pop a circuit breaker or burn out a fuse. I picked the water equilibrium metaphor because it helps me visualize what's happening, for example, in a battery. 
when we when we have that connected circuit, the positive pole has this abundance of electrons, and it's seeing across this electromagnetic field a place for electrons to go. There's a deficit of electrons, so they're going to try to find electrical equilibrium. Uh, they're going to try to negate the potential difference between those two poles by moving, and that movement draws current through the load. And over time, the negative pole of the battery is going to start accumulating electrons, and the positive pole is going to start losing electrons. And when they achieve equilibrium, then you have a dead battery. So we say electricity flows from plus to minus, from positive to ground, through the path of least resistance. And that sounds sort of like water. Okay, so a quick recap. Electricity is moving charge. Usually in a circuit, this is electrons moving from a voltage source through a load to ground. The moving charge, called current, is measured in units called amperes or amps. You can think of it as the volume of electrons. It's how many electrons pass through a given point in the circuit over a certain period of time. Current flowing from a voltage source, like the positive terminal of a battery, to a negative terminal or ground is called direct current or DC. Current flowing from a wall outlet or some other source where the polarity, the plus and minus poles, is alternating is called alternating current, or AC. The electromotive potential between two points in a circuit is measured in units called volts. Volts don't flow. Rather, they are a measure of the difference in electrical potential between two points. In the water metaphor, it's the water pressure. We say either there are this many volts across these points, or there are this many volts at this point in the circuit, meaning there's that many volts between that point and the negative pole or ground. The electrical impedance or resistance in a circuit is measured in units called ohms, represented by the Greek symbol omega. Electromotive potential in volts multiplied by the current in amps equals power, which is measured in watts. We design circuits to pass electrical energy through some kind of a load, using that energy for some purpose and preventing a short circuit. That does it for part one of this introduction.